Hello, everybody, and welcome back to episode number 25 of the Roses and Rhetoric podcast. I am your host, Jimmy Hackett. Joining me, as always, my charming co-host, Joseph Stanford. And joining us today, very special guest, Francisco, a researcher in neuroscience at the University of San Francisco. And we're going to go to Francisco first for a quick introduction and then talk to him a little bit about the work he does in the lab. Yeah, hi. So yeah, my name is Francisco Aparicio. I'm originally from Bakewood, California. You know, the winter school in SD, San Diego, UCSD, and now I'm here at UCSF studying neuroscience. I'm in a uh, lab with a neurologist who studies stroke and recovery after stroke. He does things from like, uh, you know, working with mice all the way up to the human level where he's doing some brain computer interface stuff. So we're just looking at neural networks and uh, how the behavior of neurons changes through learning and time and after stroke and how we can come up with certain uh, treatments like maybe some sort of electrical stimulation to try to improve uh, recovery after stroke or even you know use brain signals to control to control uh, you know devices like robotic devices so like a, an arm for someone who is uh, you know has suffered a, a, an extreme sh- uh, stroke and can no longer part of the body right so yeah very interesting so, that is uh, quite a bit, and uh, we were going to come back to that uh, because I think there's a lot to be said for neuroscience. Definitely one of the newer sciences, definitely a, a, a frontier endeavor. But before we do that, everybody who's been following the show for a while knows that Joe is not in his normal location. Joe, obviously you're traveling. Tell us a little bit about your travels, where you are, and what brought you there. Yeah, so uh, I'm obviously out of studio today. Decided to make the trip out here to... Uh give you some nice scenery to see. You can see behind me, we have a beautiful Brooklyn Bridge um, spanning the coast, looking beautiful in the background. Um, came out here to visit Cam and uh, Francisco. Uh, got to point out, he, Francisco actually just got a big award. Um, oh yeah, yeah. Uh, you yeah. wanna talk about your fellowship and that type of stuff? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, there's this uh, fellowship called the NSF Fellowship. It's, uh, uh, you know, most graduate students apply for it once you're like in your first, second year. and. Uh, yeah, and that uh, is basically going to fund me for the next several years. And yeah, yeah, you know, it's a, quite a surprise. It, it's just a uh, one, one time fellow, right? Yeah, well, no, I'm a one time fellow, three time fellow. So I like to say, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I've gotten several fellowships since I've been here, and it's just it's a good thing. You know, it's, just, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. But I well, do want to, like, uh, you know, kind of interject for a moment and say that. Uh, you know, we're kind of not doing the scene justice because if we look that way, we have all kinds of things going on, right? You have, uh, you, know, you know, our setup is a little funky here, but um, we actually have Alcatraz over there, which is pretty interesting, and San Francisco Bridge back there, right? And it's, actually, that's my bridge, right? So, you know, um, my name is Francisco, and, and, you know, I'm originally from L.A., but, you know, that bridge right there, that big red bridge connects San Francisco to a county called Marin County, right? And my middle name is Marin, so it's literally like, it's my bridge, right? And and, and so people might say that, you know, there, there's some certain things that's coincidence, but I just think it's destiny, right? It's just like, you know, I think someone had the intuition to say, one day this man will be right here and I'm just gonna prepare the whole situation for him, for him to be able to tell this story, right? And I think that's really what happened. Anyways, back to you. Well, yeah. wait, 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 wait. Let's uh, let's not move on. I mean, so I I know a, a little bit about graduate school, and I know that NSF fellows are are very hard to come by. I mean, this is actually a very impressive accomplishment. Uh, tell us a little bit about the project that you proposed. As I understand, you went to NSF fellow by proposing a project that they approved for you to research. Tell us a little bit about that process and the work that you did uh, for the fellowship I mean, that this is a, an incredible accomplishment yeah so the, the fellowship yeah it's interesting yeah uh, so you're right you have to uh they they in, they uh review an application and look at the person holistically but a component is that of that is your personal statement your letter of references and um your your project your, your project that, that you propose and, and my project is it's, it's a pretty interesting project so my lab does a lot right and one of the things we're trying to do is you know, when, when, when someone suffers a stroke, is essentially you're losing blood flow to a particular area of the brain, it dies, right? And when you, that area, you know, you, you're losing neurons, right? And, and one of the things we're trying to work on is um, implanting neurons or stem cells or young neurons into that region 
and having them integrate into the system that is in place there, right? And um, another thing that happens with, with a stroke, you can lose projections from one area of the brain to the other. So we're trying to establish, we were trying to grow neurons in a petri dish with their axons. So neurons are these cells that have a cell body and then they have this, uh, uh, like, uh, they're kind of like trees. I look at them like trees very frequently. They look like neurons. They have this, like, uh, they have these branches that like uh, accept signals. And then they have this kind of like very thin, uh, just think about it as this little like cable going outwards that they use to transmit a signal. And we're trying to grow these neurons in a dish with their axons, which are those thin cables that they're projecting their signal through. Um, in this dish and then once they're grown like and have extended their axon we're trying to implant them into the brain and connect two regions of the brain that have well they lost their connections after stroke right so my project was based on that idea right that we're gonna there's this the brain has this connectivity and then once a stroke happens that connectivity is just completely disrupted and we're trying to reestablish that connectivity and see if we could use that as a form of like uh, a, like it's not treatment, but you know, as a way to help help people rehabilitate after stroke, right? Because one of the main things you can do all kind of uh, you know, all sort of like rehabilitative like uh, exercises and things like that, but you're not gonna reestablish the connections that were lost in the brain, right? So it's a way of trying to put what put 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 back into this the, the brain right exactly what was lost these connections between two different regions and and hopefully by doing that you can help people you know just live a normal life right and no. it's just def definitely not a, a a small feat it's like something that has not been done and it's going to take a lot of like effort and a lot of there's going to be a lot of failure we know it we've already started experiencing that but you know if we could make some sort of progress on that it would be amazing now, Francisco, we're going to go back to Joe in a moment for the weekly roundup. But before doing that, let's let's spend a little bit of time talking about stem cell research because my I, I have friends that work in this field as well that do stem cell research, and I think uh, to make people aware of this, there was a breakthrough a number of years ago where scientists figured out how to take functioned adult cells, reconvert them back to stem cells introduce them to different mixtures that would occur at different locations in the body that they would then result in them turning into a different type of cell. Talk a little bit about that process and kind of ground people in what you're talking about. Because if I understand properly, this, this breakthrough in stem cell research has really been um, kind of this, this floodgate of opportunity uh, for various treatments. And it, it sounds like what you're describing is building off of that work. Talk a little bit about that process, a little bit about that part of the, of the work that you're doing, and then we'll get it back to Joe for the weekly roundup. Yeah, so uh, as far as stem cells go, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a neuroscientist, right? And I'm working with these stem cells, but, uh, you know, we're working with them at a point where we're just essentially getting the stem cells and then converting them into neurons. And, um, but yeah, but the process that you explained is exactly, you know, there was a breakthrough in which, and I'm almost sure it's like something to do with like some skin cells, right? So like uh, skin cells have this unique property, right? We, we, we're constantly shedding skin, right? And, and, and uh, they have this unique property where they are able to like regenerate themselves and things like that, right? So um, somewhere along those lines is where some genius was able to create this, this, this you know, process in which, yeah, you're able to revert them back to a state where, you know, they are able to, the term is differentiate, right, into uh, whatever cell type you want. And it's interesting because you can have a stem cell and it's going to become whatever its environment is turning into become, right? So as scientists, we can manipulate that environment. Like I said, we get stem cells and it's just, we're going to put the right uh, chemicals in there that are going to say, hey, I'm supposed to be a neuron. And then they start like to differentiate into uh, a neuron. Right? So, so the stem cells, you're saying it's like a, a blank etch a sketch that you're working with and then yeah. you can kind of code it and then tell it what to do and train it in a way to yeah. carry a certain function. Essentially, yeah, yeah. You just, it's just, uh, you just put something in a, in, in a particular environment and it will become whatever that environment is, right? And I guess that's kind of like a little, it's a philosophical thing, right? You think about life and it's the same thing. You put a person in a particular place and they're going to become whatever that place is, right? And that kind of, that, that's kind of what happens with these uh, stem cells. 
Well, speaking of putting people in different places and seeing how they adapt, let's move it back over to Joe. He's in California having a good time. Normal hunting grounds would be Portland, excellent time. Would be Portland, Oregon. But again, we find Joe today in San Francisco. Joe, tell us a little bit about the travel, a little bit about the fun you've been having there, and uh, just your overall impression of of the of the city. Is this your first time being there? Yeah. Uh, so a lot of people hate, uh, have mixed feelings on the travel during COVID times, like in the airports and things like that. But it, it's way better than traveling without it. Like there's often the middle seats not taken um there's just smaller lines like tsa is a breeze to get through it, it's just an overall more pleasant traveling experience and uh yeah i think it was earlier this week i i looked at the calendar and i saw it was spring break and i didn't have any plans yet so i figured why not make a quick trip over here to, to san francisco and visit the boys you know um but yeah it's it's very different um san francisco compared to portland I was talking about it before and I think that the biggest difference is just the amount of like diversity here. Like I was sitting at a park yesterday and there's just not only different individual groups of different cultures and people, but like even the individual sets themselves were mixed. And uh, you know, you can't help but think that maybe that has something to do with all the innovation and technology that comes out of Silicon Valley is because of this, it's like a giant melting pot. Um, as opposed to Portland, which is just like 99.5% white people in uh, Columbia jackets. <laughs> <laughs> and it will, Columbia or maybe even like Carhartt, you know, if they're really going for the hipster vibe. But, um, oh, yeah, yeah. You'll see some the Carhartt beanies too. Those will make a, a pop out. No, what? it's the uh, Patagonian people. Yeah, the, the Patagonian. Patagonian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's, yeah. let's take oh, a moment okay. real quick and, and let's, let, let, let's focus on this idea of the middle seat in the, in the airplane. Now, yeah. Joe, I'm going to remind you, you and I, people who don't know, people who haven't been following on the show, Joe and I went to the same high school, but we're not really friends until college. We, you know, Joe had a friend group that I kind of integrated myself into. Now, one of the ways that I did this, and Joe, I don't know if you remember this, but one of the things that I pioneered was calling backseat middle as opposed to calling shotgun. Now, I, I think that prepared me for the middle seat because as you know, I'm about 5'6", 130, 140, depending on the season. I fit nicely into that middle seat. And I don't mind it. I'm used to it. I'm, I'm sized for it properly. I'm wondering, without that middle seat experience, are we going to make people too soft? What do you think about that? <laughs> um, I, I hear what you're saying about the middle seat. It's, and there's two good points about it. It's always available because no one wants it. So you always get to choose what you get. And it's, it's balanced, right? Like you, you're balanced right in the middle of the vehicle. Um, with that being said, like it depends who the passengers are on either side of you in the back seat. That's true. That's true. Like, you got like two sweaty dudes next to you. That's a different story than if you have like not two sweaty dudes. Really, anything else would be preferable. But I, I'd like to hear Francisco's take on this too. Me, me too. Me too. So you know what? It's it's funny. We're talking about travel during COVID times. I actually traveled in like the like peak of covid i actually went to alaska you know it's a crazy thing that i uh i decided to get a dog and i went to alaska to get him and this was uh in july like mid-july which was like you know everything was just shut down it wasn't even it wasn't suggested that you stay home it's like no you have to stay home right literally like uh, as far as san francisco it was a lockdown right and no one could go anywhere and do anything so um I'm there and it's like, I'm traveling, I'm being careful, I'm wearing my mask. And, you know, there's other people that are just aren't respecting that rule, right? And it's just like, it, it, it's upsetting, right? But it, luckily, yeah, there, there was that, I guess that, I guess the airlines had the rule where they're not like putting that like um, middle seat. And I have to admit, that was nice, right? Just thinking about like, just having in the space, I think we've gotten so accustomed to just be, like dealing with the circumstances that, that you know, are enforced on us right like you have to have a middle seat why it's like i like the space i don't have to be crammed into the space right so a lot of times the middle seat for me feels like you know it's it's very i don't know it's it's invasive and like I, although if you're okay with people you can you know be in this group and it is convenient to have it but i personally think it's a burden i i don't like that middle seat. <laughs> that's and, and i'm also yeah. not that big but still at the same time it's like oh, I, I could do without the, the middle seat I think I think all those are, are definitely fair points. And I would say 
you know, for anybody listening, thinking about that middle seat, you know, one of the things, and th this was true 2020, and we'll see this still true 2021, I still think the best bang for your buck on those airlines is to look for the emergency row seats. I, I to this day, meaning last year, to this day, still find open emergency aisle seats. Plenty of leg room, very spacious. Sometimes don't even have the full three, depending on the on the on the airline. There might just be two seats, depending on how they you know split you know that aisle. Uh, I routinely find those seats open, and so I. If we're talking about seat preference, we're talking about making the hard decision about where you want to sit. I, I really got to push for that emergency aisle seat. Yeah, I, I want to get both of you guys' takes on this. This is something I was thinking when I was in the airport this last time. So what if I just wait to be the very last person on the airplane, like boarding group seven, I just let everyone else go, and then I come on. And if I'm the very last person on the airplane and I'm walking up, and as I'm walking through first class, I see open first class seat. I can just take that, right? Like, that's just fair game. No one's going to, what's the worst they're going to do? Send me to my actual seat? Well, like, what, you, right, know, right. You're from yeah. What do you think of that? that yeah, what do you think? Game or what? Hey, Francisco, what do you think on this? Give us, give us your take on this. What would, yeah. what, actually, let's, let's, let's rephrase. Let's say, let, let's say this. What would, what would Francisco do? Let's, let, let's put him in that airplane. Rocking what would Francisco do now? You know, I'm a very cautious person. What I grew up is just like, uh, you know, that there's no getting away with things. It's like because people are automatically assuming you're doing something, right? So it's just like, you know, but uh, I, you know, coming here and it's been a different experience, and then seeing how other people walk around and just like take risks that I would not take because I'm like, it's just I know where this is going to end up. Hmm. Uh, you know, it's interesting to just watch people do some things. I'm like, no, you don't understand. You know, just, you're about to get in trouble. And they just get away with it, right? And then it's, it's shocking to me, right? So if I was, let's just say I theoretically, hypothetically, I was a white person, yeah, I would sit down there because people would be like, oh, he belongs here, right? And, uh, you know, it, it would work out. And um, maybe one day we'll be in a position where I could just, like, do that myself and just walk and say, hey, I'm just going to sit down here and no one's going to think that I'm not supposed to be here, right? If I, okay, if I knew I could get away with it, I would do it. That's, that's the bottom line. Yeah, why not? Uh, that's like, especially if it's open. Right. Yeah, uh, it's that's open, interesting no take. Else is sitting there. It's not yeah. be empty yeah. either way. It's interesting take. It's interesting take on this. Um and uh I I want to hear more about Alaska from Francisco real quick before we move on. Tell us about Alaska because I've never been there before. Um I, I know people that have been there before. I, I usually only hear good things about it. Tell us about your time in Alaska picking up your dog. Before we go there, I think we got to talk about the dog a little bit. We got to oh, set the yeah. stage. Oh, well, sure, sure. Tell us. Well, yes, let's let's start with the this, dog. This dog is making incredible. model. Okay, let's let's uh, let's make a model. Sure. So yeah, he's yeah. uh he's an Alaskan. Okay. And then uh he's a Malamute. Malamute. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, yeah. So he's yeah he's an he's an Alaskan Malamute and uh he's about ninety pounds now and just like this big fluff. Yeah, he's, got more like, yeah. he's big. Yeah, he's big, and and it's interesting. Like I said, I just got him July, right? July, he was 18 pounds. He literally fit under the seat of this, like, uh, you know, the airplane seat. He fit under in the in my little carrying case that I bought for him, right? He was like this big, and now he's a monster, right? And then like, uh, yeah, but he's uh, very energetic. He's very like social. It's just like uh, yeah, if I take him anywhere, he's just running around. Like he runs to people, and people get scared. And then they realized, like, this is just, you know, this very friendly fluffy dog that's coming at me. Like, yeah, Jim, this dog is straight white fang, like straight call of the wild like, yeah. beast, like meant to be like pulling like, big sleds and stuff. Yeah. But, it, and if he wasn't friendly, that would be an issue, but this is the friendliest dog like, yeah. I've ever met. Like, he just wants to like party all the time. And yeah, just the sheer power, just girth of this dog just yeah. everything is incredible no it's like sometimes like, he just like swings his head yeah. right like he's just like he just gets excited and starts doing this and like he, he hit me once and it's just like it was i don't know if he would have gone a little harder if i would have passed out like literally i was just like kind of like confused for a minute right like he just has so much power like this is not the type of dog that you can get in the continental u.s you gotta go you gotta, <laughs> you gotta go, go north, you gotta go north to get something like this <laughs> you, gotta, you gotta have a country between you to yeah. yeah, you gotta be closer to Russia to get this type right. of yeah, yeah. This type closer of closer to the uh, to the uh, frontier to the to, to, to the wilderness. Um, yeah. I bet that is a fun dog. I'm curious how it is adapting to the uh, 
you know, to the environment of San Francisco? You know, at, no, initially it was very tough for him because I got him during the summer and he had his puppy coat, right? Which is a lot thicker. And yeah, he would. He still got yeah. a thick coat. Yeah, he still got yeah. a thick coat, but it wasn't like, uh, like now it's just longer. But mm. but uh, his puppy coat was just so dense, like it was just right. he was just like a like a like a cotton ball, right? And then um, he, you know, yeah, you could see him getting out of breath like very quickly, just like he's just laying there, just <laughs> like just trying to like you know just cool down, right? But uh, now he, he he does a lot better, and and uh, he's still yeah he's still in his shape. He's out like uh, in like warm weather for just like doing ex- ex- some extraneous. Like he's just like exercising, running around playing with other dogs and he's just gonna sit down and you can tell that he's like kind of going through, he's having a hard time right but uh yeah he he does run it well right it's just like um they get used to it i i heard that yeah, yeah that, that, I, you know what this is what the breeder told me that they their coats actually adapt right so mm-hmm. it's like it's not going to be as thick if he's in this environment as it would if he was still in alaska right because it gets right. colder there and things like that yeah. now is the malamute is it a, is it a water dog will it swim yeah, you know, I haven't put him in that situation. Um, I think he will. I, I we actually, you know, I was on the beach with uh, our buddy, and he actually, yeah, yeah, he ran right straight into the water and had no problem. I was hoping he went further in, but he didn't. But I haven't put him in that situation. But you know, I might give that a try. Very good, very good. Well, any any more comments on Alaska before we get into the meat of the episode? Sounds like it was a fun okay. Day. Yeah, so Alaska is interesting, right? Uh, one thing I didn't know. That the North Pole is literally in Alaska. It makes sense because I looked at the map, right? And it's like like it's like very far up there. And I guess I just didn't, you know, just you know, thinking about America and like I didn't I didn't feel that it was that far up, right? right? Mm-hmm. But like literally I was I was there and I was on Google Maps trying to just okay, what am I gonna, am I gonna do? Because everything shut down. And then I get I'm shocked. I'm like, wait, this says the North Pole. And I zoom in and then I ask someone about it. They're like, Yeah, the North Pole's right there. So I go to the North Pole. And, you know, Santa's house is there and then I'm walking around and everything is it's, it's, it's closed. Right. But just kind of trying to see what the situation is like. Then I see this guy. Right. He's like walking his dog. Big, heavy set guy. Got some beard, white, white beard, hair. And I'm just like, wait a minute. This is Santa. So I walk up to him. I'm like, excuse me, sir. Are you Santa? He's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, that's exactly what Santa would say. He's like, I'm just a caretaker. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and he just and just like okay sure so then like he walks into the building and, and then he told me that i could just like walk around and like another thing i found out that deer and reindeer are two completely different things mm. um reindeer Horns. actually you know they they they're they're like horns whatever you want to call them actually are velvety right and uh-huh. it's like it's it's interesting that I have pictures and you can see it in the pictures. You can see the fuzz in it, right? And it's just, they're completely different animals. And I had no clue. You know, I just thought it was just like, you know, some decorative thing, I guess. I don't know what I thought, but the point is, yeah, it was, it was an interesting situation. It was and a yeah. branding thing. It was, it, was, it was a branding decision. We need to put a little point. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. This is marketing. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, but uh, yeah, no, Alaska, it seems like a nice place. I, I would like to go back when it's not shut down. A lot of uh, nature. It was very nice. It was, uh, it looked like this at 3 a.m. Right. And yeah, right. It, was, it was during the summer where it's mostly sunlight. And yeah, it was, it was that that in itself. I, I uh, you know, I traveled overnight. And when I got there, it was like like 3 a.m. Like, exactly. Right. And, and, and it looked like this. And my body was confused. It's just like I'm I'm awake. And let's go. And I'm just like, no, it's not what's happening right now because I just like stayed up all night. Right. So, yeah. But nice place. I recommend well, I think that's a nice tie-in for one of the topics for, for today. You were talking about staying up all night. You're talking about preparing your body for 3 a.m. I wanted to revisit, and Joe, remind me, I, I'm not sure if we discussed this on the podcast before or not. I want to, again, if we have, we're going to do it again. I have some more things to say about it, but I wanted to talk about the art, the art form, let me say, of the all-nighter. The all-nighter. The all-nighter. Now, and let me let me explain why. America's been under lockdown for a year or so, and the vaccines are out, and we're seeing signs of improvement, light at the end of the tunnel. All right. Well, guess what? America's been out of shape for a whole year about pulling the all-nighter at the bar scene. And I want to give our audience, I want to give our audience a little bit 
of some grounding for things they can do to literally stay up all night and have a fun time. And before we hop into some, some of the advice that I think both of us have, Francisco being a new guest, let's, let's have Francisco open up a little bit. Francisco, I want you to kind of, you know, close your eyes, kind of go back in time. 2019, 2020, you're going out, and you're going to be out all night. What are, what are some of the first things you do to prepare for that endeavor? Before he goes, I, I just want to say that you don't go to, got to go back to 2019, 2020 to recreate that situation. <laughs> you got to go back to last night. Yeah. Hey, all right. Well, <laughs> we can, yeah. All right. Yeah, so then, then let's, let's, let's hear it. Let's, 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 as we're kind of getting these muscles reflexed again, let's, let's, you know, go over some of the uh, do's and don'ts and some of the key prep that we do to pull this off. And Francisco, go ahead and open it up a little bit for us. Uh, you know, uh, I'm very much a, like a go with the flow type of guy. And, you know, people are like ready to go. I'm just like, uh, you know, there might be the slight lag and it's just like, but you know, you, you just rally, right? It's just about rallying. And I keep that in my mind and like that, literally that term, just rally and just make it happen. And you got to get in the, you have to, you know, soak in the vibes and really like feel what's like the atmosphere is right and, and and i think that goes a long way when everyone's like you know trying to have a good time you just like it's this excitement and it just that excitement is, in itself is energy right and uh right. it just you find yourself where you're having a good time and i mean it's hard to just cut it like turn it off right it's just like uh i don't know you, you run a bunch of good people having a good time and, and you just want to keep going right keep you want to prolong this good time and for me i'm, I'm always trying to do that prolong the good moments right because they're, they're they can't be few and far between so you might as well enjoy them while you're having them right so i think for me that that's kind of like the main thing that kind of fuels my like energy when i'm out and even though i'm sitting here and it's like you know my second day in a row drinking and it's like i didn't want to drink the first day now i'm on the second day where i want to drink less than i wanted to drink the day before that because now i'm like like slightly hung over but it's just like hey you know how often are you gonna get you know a friend come visit and and you're going to go out and have a good time. And, and yeah, it, it's just, you, you rally. I like that. I, I think a lot of good advice there. In particular, this idea of the night becoming self-perpetuating. And I, that is such a key moment in the night. And it has to happen organically. You, you really can't predict when it will happen. Sometimes it happens at 11 p.m. Sometimes it happens at 2.30 a.m. You never know when the gears are going to take over and run the machine. Uh, so we're going to come back to that notion of rallying in just a bit. Let's go over to Joe, though, and have him kind of key us in. Let's, let, let's build off of some of Francisco's key ideas. Let's add in some of our own. Joe, okay. the all-nighter, guide us through what you're doing to make it a successful outing. Uh, well, I would like to distinguish between the, the academic all-nighter versus yeah. the social all-nighter. Absolutely. And, and let's feel comfortable to discuss both. Let's let's okay. let's let's explore that space. I, I think I can bridge that gap. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would uh, never condone the use of drugs or any type of drugs for the sole purpose of staying up all night. I think that's a bad advice. But um, for the social aspect of being out all night, I think an important part of it is uh, really identifying, like Francisco was talking about, identifying where the energy is in the room and leveraging that to go across the whole room. Like if you have one super bright light bulb and you just point it at a corner in a room, the rest of the room is going to be in darkness. And only one corner is going to be lit. You, but you got to you got to distribute the lights around the whole room. Like make sure there's good energy balance going through. Yeah. And energy is contagious. So if you have good energy and you're bringing that to the table, then everyone else is going to reciprocate that energy, and then the interaction will be prolonged. Uh, as far as academic all nighters, that's where you start getting into hard territory because you got no one else to boost your state. It's just you and this like boring ass textbook that you're reading or whatever. Um, Even in that, in that, that situation, I think there, there's always that energy and you always have to find that energy, right? Because you you, find, yeah, find yeah. The motivation. that motivation is exactly, you want to pass, right? You want to, you want to do well in this class and you realize that it's going to take you studying all night. And that's fuel, right? And, and there's always some sort of fuel that is kind of driving this behavior. You're not going to stay up all night randomly 
for no reason when you're doing nothing, yeah. right? You need to literally have something that's like pushing you, driving you yeah. to stay up because your body's gonna start trying to shut down on its own, right? And 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 just like it can't be this this uh you know this desire to succeed in the academic sense, there's also right. this desire to have a good time, right? Like I was absolutely that's a good point like to not fail the exam or to not like do perform perform yeah. poorly the next day you gotta that sometimes that's enough to like get you going like you're like okay i still have to study like four chapters that are gonna be covered on this exam like you gotta get it done and it just, yeah and then you can look forward to that 6 a.m breakfast for you that was always like a, a good motivator for me uh, yeah yes. I, I i absolutely agree with that let me let me share anybody listening and i you guys let me know if you agree with this or not i i always feel and let me let me start with the academic all-nighter close that out and let's move over to the social all-nighter and kind of reopen that a little bit but there's there's a, a very toxic effect that can happen when you make the decision to pull the all-nighter that goes a little something like this if it's 8 p.m and your test is at 8 a.m the next morning if you're gonna go to bed at 10 you only have two hours to study and you got to be light and rockets to get that bad boy done on time once you make the decision to pull the all nighter you now have this little voice in your head whispering saying something to the effect of we have 12 hours to study why start now you have 12 hours to get this pulled off and then you begin the spiral well i don't need to study for 12 hours i need to study maybe five so i'll take the next however many hours off and catch it on the tail end. And that's like, it goes in around the, the five hour mark. You tell you know, sorry, self, you know what? I only need three hours to study. I'm going to wait two more hours and I'll be fine. And then you realize it's 730. In that season of reading, I want to use blue through. It's over. The show is over. And you haven't done any studying because you lost your time by feeding yourself the lie that you needed less time to study. So don't, don't do that. If you're going to pull the all-nighter, commit yourself to a time block that you will spend on that test. Do not blow through an entire season of Reno 911 only to realize <laughs> you haven't got any studying done. Don't do that. Now, let's go back to the social all-nighter. Let's talk a little bit about, and I, and I've, I saw this in a, in a beer commercial the other week. And I'm glad we're talking about it in the beginning because in my mind, this is a crucial element of the, of the, of the, of the well-executed all-nighter. I'm talking about the pregame nap. Let's talk about this because honestly, I'll tell you something right now. I don't think we talk about this enough. That's a great we point. Always, we always talk about get eight hours of sleep, avoid phantom lighting, turn your phone off. We never talk about how much sleep you need before you drink too much. We never talk about that. Now, on, the, on, on this show, we break down barriers. And we're going to break down this barrier today. Now, let's, let's, let's go in the order again. Francisco, warm us up a little bit. Talk to us about the benefits, social, mental, spiritual, the benefits of the pre-game nap. So just see that you bring this up because, uh, <laughs> like I said, uh, it was it was yesterday and we're there and like we're dead like the whole day like we just went so hard the day before that that like yesterday it, it it took us a while to get going right but one of the things that was recommended and actually like was taken advantage of was the free all night or nap right and uh, <laughs> I went I went and I was laying down in my bed and I could not fall asleep so. I, I guess what I'm saying is it's a relative thing and it's it's always I wish you know I'm not much of a sleeper and I'm much of a napper so for me I went there and I was like I was tired and I was like I you know I, I need I need I need some rest right and I can see that it, it can be a very beneficial thing and actually one of our buddies was actually took full advantage of it and like he you know he came back and he was ready right but uh yeah I guess it's, it's on a case by case basis but I, I mean, I'm pretty sure that if I would have slept some, I uh, would have been a lot better through the night. But once again, that energy kind of like supersedes everything else, right? Like I can be almost dead and like going for like three nights in a row, but if I'm around a group of people and then everyone's like, yeah, let's have a good time, this and that, that it does something for you psychologically to where like 
whatever is physiologically happening in your body saying you need to sleep, you need to rest, at least for the moment, kind of just goes away. Yeah. And, and you're just like, I'm just like, once, once again, it's just the same thing about this, the stress about failing and doing that. We have the same stress about like letting go of this opportunity to have a good time, right? Because like that ultimately is very important in life, right? Like, uh, you know, just think about how much you work, right? And how much, how much of an opportunity you have to have a good time. And I think for us, because, you know, it's so disproportionate, we work most of the time. And then there's a small amount of time where you could actually have a good time. You're like, I'm just gonna you gotta pack it all in. Yes, I'm gonna embrace this. I'm gonna like take it back full advantage of this. And I think that in itself, it's just kind of it drives you. It's almost like a panic to say, I'm gonna lose out on this good time. Right? Wait, wait. People would uh define, you know, nowadays. I don't like using terms like this, but you know, people say it and this might uh you know resonate with our uh, younger audience, you know, the FOMO, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah so there's always that right it's just that this idea where we're we're having a good time but people are having a good time and, and you can be part of that and enjoy yourself and then talk about it one day i think that's also important right? we can talk, hey, remember that one time we're having like a great time we went out and like we were at this bar and like you know whatever xyz story comes up and i think that in itself is that driving force right so yes sleep is important everyone please sleep but you can't get by without it <laughs> Just saying, I, I I mean, I probably in the past three days, I have like roughly 10, 12 hours to sleep in me, you know, and it's like, it's fine. But look at it, he doesn't even look tired, right? Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's still going. Shades, right? Still going. Well, we have good energy. We have good energy on this podcast. And now, Joe, let's go to you a little bit for the pregame nap, and then we'll start with a few more things on this all in night. Oh, right. But let's, let's get your take on this. So the, the, the key thing to keep in mind about the pregame nap is that everyone's different, right? Like I'm the type of person that once I get into like a, a deep sleep cycle, like I wake up right away. So like a pregame nap is only like on the scale of 10 minutes for me. Yeah. yeah. Um, because otherwise I'm just going to wake up and I'm just going to toss and turn and I'm not going to sleep and I'm just going to waste another like hour just laying there. But some people take full advantage of that time. They get some, some <laughs> sleep cycles. In. They get They get after it, you know? But at the end of the day, like as long as one person from the group gets a good pregame nap in, they can bring that energy that's contagious and it can spread to the others. I agree. So I agree, with all, the I agree with all of that. I agree with all of that. Um, I, I definitely, you know, again, light it in the tunnel. We're working through this. You know, let's all, when, we, when you know, when it's time to go back out, pull it down. Let's all just try to remember a couple of simple things about the all-nighter let's do it right let's do it safely let's make sure we're you know hydrating and all that good stuff but uh it's a skill that you need to have you know i really i really think that um i'm the kind of person who if i needed to i could pull an all-nighter drop of the hat no knows this you know i it, it's it's one of my special skills and i you know people need to develop that muscle i, I really believe that um there's only so many hours in a day, and I really hate the idea of somebody being on the verge of a breakthrough and thinking, well, wait a minute, I got to go to bed. No, unless you're tired. Okay. That was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed that, guys. I really enjoyed that. I covered a lot of good ground on that. I wanted to uh, open up a little bit to, to Francisco. Let's, let, let's go back to the neuroscience. Let's go back to the important work being done on neuroscience. And let's talk about stroke and the work that you're doing as it pertains to stroke. So you set the table at the beginning of the podcast, you know, basically a stroke is when part of your brain is deprived of oxygen by virtue of being deprived of blood flow. And your group is looking at injecting stem cells into that part of the brain such that those stem cells, or, or rather they would be neurons at that point, uh, re rehabilitate or, or, or heal that part of the brain. Is there a reason why you chose this area of research of neuroscience in particular? Uh, it's interesting, and uh, I, I don't, I don't like a, a lot. People try to like come up with all kind of reasons for why they're doing X, Y, like X, X or Y type of research, right? And for me, it's just like this is this is like I, I rotated in a couple labs and all like, hey, this is this is something I can see myself doing. So many questions there. It's, I, I guess the main thing is the difficulty and the fact that I've always wanted to do something that's not easy because 
not easy is fun, right? Easy gets boring very fast, right? And in neuroscience in general, you can have, I mean, we understand very little about the brain, right? Like, like currently we're, you know, one of, the, one of the revolutions that's happening in neuroscience right now is the fact that we're now looking at cells that are not neurons, right? And to understand that the field has been built on this idea that neurons are the ones propagating the signals, and that's true, but they're only doing that because the support system around them, all kind of other cells, are doing what they have to do to allow them to communicate their signal. But once that other system starts malfunctioning, it could disrupt the way, you know, these neurons are functioning, right? So there's just so much there and so much we don't understand. And for me, that's fun, right? And and, and it's particularly in this field, in this particular area, it's just that it's, uh, for one, it's uh, it's something very new and something that we are failing at a lot. Like I mentioned, you're gonna have failures because it's just, you know, right now we've gotten to the point where the cells are just there and they're alive, right? And we're just happy that they're there and they're alive, right? Because normally cells just die when you're trying to, you know, put them in a system that where they where they are not naturally in, right? So um, it's exciting just the fact that they're alive and we can see, we can monitor them and actually record their activity while they're alive, but they're not really doing anything, right? And it's just like, you know, yes, it's been some sort of failure, you know, I guess uh, relatively, when you start thinking about what can you actually like well, what the end the end goal is but at the same time it's just like it has been some progress right so the thing is about talking to this pi and like the uh, primary investigator um the guy that runs the lab and he the way he thinks say he's just he's just always thinking about doing something revolutionary and doing something big right and for me that's very it's very like uh it, it drew me towards that lab because it's just like I know that you know a lot of people take particular paths in their you know educational career um, paths right but for me it's like uh, I, I I got to the point where it's just like I want to do this because it's a passion and it's not like what I'm gonna make of it right it's just like I don't care it might take me longer to take on this like crazy project and do something but I want to do something meaningful I told him I want to do something impactful. And I don't care how long it takes me. And I just want to be in a place where that's going to, you know, foster that and allow me to do something impactful. And he said, like, yeah, I completely agree. And he has lived up to that. Like, I'm sitting down and we have conversations and it's like sometimes unproductive, I'll admit. But we're talking about like some like crazy ideas. And, and like we're, we're literally trying to do something that people, if you ask any other, like, like well, a lot of other neuroscience, not any, just like other neuroscience, they'll be like, yeah. Why would you do that? And we're just like, why not, right? That's, I guess, the mentality we have. Why not? And we're gonna do these things that are gonna be revolutionary and hopefully I can be a part of that, right? And, and one of those things are just taking on projects like this where you're literally trying to in inject some stem cells into a stroke cavity and have them innovate into the system. And the idea of that, just think about that, right? It's just, it's, I don't know if it's just my bias, just my brain, just thinking about it with the knowledge that I have, but just the fact that you're introducing something into a system has no business being there, and then it becomes part of that system. And not only that, it, it actually drives some sort of like, like change in behavior, right? I think that's amazing to be able to do that. We can do that like often all around the world, right? And it's like, but the brain is just complex. And like I mentioned, there's all kinds of cells involved there. So it's, it's, it's uh, there's, a, there's a lot of work that can be done there. And I just feel like this, 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 this path that I've taken, right? This, 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 this project, right? About, I could probably spend my career trying to regenerate the stroke cavity, right? And I guess that's one of the main things that draws me to a project like that. Yeah. This is uh, really nice because, you know, two of the recurring themes on this show one is the role of complexity in life. Two, the value of secrets. The two normally go hand in hand. The more complex something is, the better it can hide its secrets. Describe a little bit where the cutting edge of stroke treatment is now with regards to the stroke cavity and explain why, why you think your research is better than the current methodology for care. Well, the current methodology is there is no methodology there. Like, um, it is just, just frankly, you have a stroke and it's just trying to do some sort of uh, 
behavioral like uh, um, treatment, just like we're gonna get you to you go through some sort of rehabilitation, try to regain whatever uh, function you lost because the brain is amazing, right? So this is one of the things why, you know, it's interesting to look at the system before and after stroke because um, you can lose a portion of your brain, literally a portion of your brain and be completely fine. Because the rest of the brain will take so, over. Yeah, somehow the brain is able to readjust its activity there's a term called functional connectivity and uh, like structural connectivity, right? The way the actual biology, like like I said, there's neurons and the way they're connected, that's the structural connect connectivity. But even within those connections, some can be weak, some can be stronger, and that's functional connectivity, right? Yeah. So you can you can you can have the brain, even though it's connected a particular way, it can change its uh, activity in a way where it's now functioning completely different, even though structurally still uh, like connect with the same way right yeah and so, so i have a question on that so typically like different parts of the brain are responsible for different activities like the hippocampus for memory or the yeah. cortex for judgment but we're saying that that doesn't always have to be the case like if you're in an accident where you have part of your prefrontal removed like will other parts of your brain pick up the slack that that part uh, no 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 not, not to that extent it's the, the whole thing we're talking about like uh you know you have the motor cortex it's such a like vast region it's, it's good portion of your brain that if you lose a portion of it which is traditionally like taking um it has a role in facilitating some sort of behavior then there's a immediate a like region around that that can step in if something goes wrong right but when you start talking about different areas of the brain we have different types of cells right that are just completely different physically right we're biologically different they are their shapes are different they're, they're non-redundant yeah it, well well, within the region, they're redundant, but like, yeah, like you talk about across brain regions, they're just different enough to where even if you try to force them to behave a particular way, they will not behave that particular way because, you know, just uh, there, there are certain properties that it's just the, the amount of channels they have or the amount of like, you know, there's just so much involved. Structurally, with different. structurally different to where like um, you can't even force them to behave the way you want them to behave. Um, because they just they just can't right it's just there's a structurally different so that's the thing it's like it, it, like if you have two adjacent regions that are really close together same type of cells and you know uh and it happens to stroke right that's one of the things that's been documented you have some reorganization of the functional connectivity around the stroke region right but if you go somewhere from like you know the motor cortex to like the, the you know visual cortex right it's just like completely different cells that are behaving differently and they're just like they're, there's things like you know temporal differences and um that, that that's very important just how how can a cell fire and like you know what patterns can it can it produce is very important when it comes to trying to like deliver a very specific signal right and certain neurons are just not going to do that because they're they're, they're just right? so yeah um yeah, to answer that question. Okay, cool. Yeah, that was actually really, Joe, I had a similar question. I'm glad that you asked it because I was curious about that as well. Is there ever a, a threat or a danger of host rejecting the new cells the way that you might reject an organ transplant? When, when we make these cells, are you using the, the host skin cells to grow the neurons or how does that come into effect? Oh no, yeah, the high chance, and that's the failure that I was talking about earlier. Like okay. this is the, this is the 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 survival rate that we're getting right now. It's, it's small, right? It's just like, um, and even then, right? Even the ones that have been like successes, quote unquote successes, um, they're just there. We're like confused. Why are they even there? Just they're alive, and they're active, and we can record them. But it's just like they're not doing anything. At least nothing that we can monitor and we've been trying like to perturb them in all kind of ways you know some sort of like uh electrical stimulation you know the arm be, and, and trying to get that you know by 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 forcing this like yeah like like with a frog where you hook up like yeah just exactly. his legs and yeah there you go popping his legs yeah so so you're the forcing, jimmy legs right? <laughs> so you're forcing this 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 the system to like behave what you expect it to behave and they're just not doing anything they're not cooperating so yes, there's some success, but uh, even, I guess it depends on what you think, right? It, it, it's yeah. a, you know, for me, it's just like, fuck, I want to do more, right? So do those cells, do they, they just, they just stay in place in a dormant state or do they get replaced or do they get removed at some point? Or 
No, no, no. Well, they're there and they're live and they're not going anywhere. They're just non-functional. No, they're doing something. We just don't know. That's the biggest question right now, right? This is where we're at. I guess uh, um, we're in this place where we're like, okay, these cells are alive. They're there. We know they're there. We, we can record them. But they don't seem to be doing anything. And, and and that's interesting. Just the fact that they can be alive there doing nothing that we can act. We're, we're monitoring them during, like, a behavior, during sleep, you know, all the time. Like, different periods, just randomly, like, hey, let's see what's going on there. And they're just, you know, casually, they'll go on for some reason and go off. And there's no pattern or anything. It's just, they're just on, right? It's crazy. Yeah. But, crazy. Uh, yeah. yeah. But, but, you wonder how they're affecting the conscious, you know, purview of the animal. If they're, they have, like, something they like, what the hell is, you know, some yeah. thought they don't know where it came from or something. Yeah. yeah. Very yeah. interesting. Yeah. But even then, like I, like, I, like I mentioned, like, there's a high failure, right? Right. This is just, right. this is, uh, we're, we're doing multiple uh, mice. And then, you know, out of like 10, you have two where the cells are alive. These are the ones we're monitoring, right? And then, um, you know, there, there's no, I guess this, this is what I was saying about doing that type of work that is like, in a sense, revolutionary, right? Where you're doing something that has not been really done before. Right. And it's like a high failure rate. And, and we're doing this and we have the high failure rate, but we're getting some successes and it's allowing us to just kind of understand the system and how can we improve the success rate, right? And that's what that's where we're at right now. And then just saying at the same time, it's just improving success rate. And then um, what what meaning can we extract from what we're actually like like witnessing right now, right? So it's very like I guess uh, an unsatisfactory answer because like I, I don't have the answers yet, and this is what I'm here doing, right? I'm gonna find right. Answers. Maybe in like two, three, four years. We can have another podcast where I'm gonna give you the updates and tell you like this. this <laughs> well, I, I I think this sounds like a really neat project, and of course, helping you know people recover from from stroke. I mean, if anything, that it seems like that might even be, you know, the the first step of many. I mean, I, I imagine there's many times where you would want to replace damaged brain tissue or something, in, in order to have a patient, you know, if it's just brain trauma just in general, or if it was something like an epileptic patient where they have a part of their brain removed to stop the epilepsy, but if you could pull it apart back, that was, that did not have the, the epileptic characteristics. Um, all of this sounds really fascinating to, to me. How, how close do you think, if, if you could define the frontier of neuroscience research, how close do you think your project is to that frontier? Are you right there on the cutting edge, or are you are you are you further back towards more of the applied region? Where where are you with regards to the cutting edge of the field? Well, uh, yeah, I think your question. Uh, I, I'm not sure I'm taking it like understanding it correctly. No, we're definitely in the cutting edge. Yeah. But as far as it being translational and actually like you can apply it, yeah, it's yeah. it's it's far because like I said, this is this is the beginning of it, right? We're doing this sure. in mice. We'll move on to do to rats and then maybe like not the primates. And then from there, if it's successful at that point, then we move on to humans. But there, there's two things, right? There's the what the science is telling us and what, uh, you know, the community, the world is, is thinking about these things, right? You have some people right now that are still rejecting the vaccine, right? And it's just because they have this sense that, you know, that there's a, there's this, uh, idea in their, their brain they don't understand how it funk how it works right what's going on biologically that they just think that you know i'm not going to take this because it's you know you know what was one of the popular conspiracy theories like uh, they, bill gates it's or, like yeah, they, they're gates. injecting or i've heard like they've never used them or in any vaccines before <laughs> yeah, so. yeah yeah so there's this idea people don't understand it right and it's the uh, even if we get to the point where it's like i can perfect the system and i'm saying i can make you your family member, whoever it is, better, they're still gonna reject it because like you're like, you know, these cells don't belong in me. There's always gonna be this idea that, you know, you're doing something that's not quote unquote natural, right? And it's like, okay, I guess for me, I understand like science, biology, the way it functions, it's just like, you know, you just have things that are happening in a particular way because you're in a particular situation, going back to this idea of stem cells becoming, you know, whatever they become. And it's just like, it doesn't matter what these, you know, proteins are composed of like 
amino acids and then it's like atoms and right and it's like as long as you have the right combination of all that it's going to behave a particular way and it doesn't matter whether it's natural or not because they're, they're atoms and they're going to do what they have to do right so in this situation we can put these atoms amino acids protein cells into this region and they're going to behave a particular way and they could be behaving normally which would be the case if the person never had a stroke but people will still not adopt that right they're not going to buy into that because it's just quote unquote not natural right so there's several hurdles that we have to cross and even if we get past the scientific hurdle there's still that hurdle where like even now right people just like here like stem cell research and they're just like whoa whoa that's crazy like no we don't want anything to do with that blah, 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 blah. Even if you explain to it, like you mentioned earlier, yes, we found a way to actually, you know, study stem cells without actually having to use embryonic stem cells, right? Um, and because that's a whole another issue in itself, people are just like, whether we should be having, like, you, get, you know, extracting stem cells from embryos and this and that, right? So it's always this, this, this thing where it's just like in science, it's like we're trying to do what we're doing and we're understanding the system the way we're understanding, but it's always the fight to get other the general public to accept what we're doing, right? And right. So yeah, so to, to answer your question, is there's several hurdles first. Like I said, give me three, four years. And when it's once it's working, then I'll come back to you and we'll just discuss it. Maybe by that time you're like a big time podcaster and like and the whole world is listening to what you're saying. And then um uh I'm gonna sit here and try to like uh you know make this pitch of why they should adopt what I'm doing. And, you know, that's going to be part of the struggle, right? It's just people aren't going to adopt it. It's like, you know. Yeah, I, I, I like, I like my, my, my favorite conspiracy was that they were putting a microchip in you. That was my favorite one. Um, now, let's, real, real quick, and, and we'll, I know we're, we're probably going to wrap up soon, but I want to, I want to get your, your, your take on, on a topic that Joe and I have talked about before on the show, which is the idea, the role of communication in public trust. As a scientist, as a researcher, given that you are on the cutting edge, what what do you see your role as in that in that world of communicating to the lay audience what you're working on to build that trust in these different institutions? Oh, that's a very interesting question. I don't I don't think I've really thought of that. Um, I think about that in the context of uh, you know trying to uplift particular communities, right? Like communities where I come from is just uh, the you know that. It's not about, well, it's about establishing the communication because it's not there, right? So, you know, there's, there's this tremendous value in helping people to understand what you're doing, even though they're, they don't have the educational background to do it, right? And it's like, I'm not saying that anyone is beneath anyone else. It's just that, you know, and even in science, right? Like, uh, I, I'm in a lab right now and I'm learning a lot but I feel like I'm, I'm lost, right? I just, I just joined this lab and, and this happens. Like I was in a lab before and when I joined it, uh, I was just lost. And then with time, you, you gain some of the knowledge, some of the fundamental the background knowledge and you're there. And then now you're able to have these crazy ass conversations with people that you never thought you would have. But then the moment like in science, it's just so niche that you can study something very specific and then everything like outside of your lab people although they're intelligent like we're talking about some of the biggest brains in the world they're just completely lost on what you're doing you have to explain it right so it's very important to be able to explain and to tell people exactly what you're doing and to get to, to understand because that that builds some sort of foundation it's about sharing the knowledge and and like um trying to get other people in a place where they can use the information you have to build something that they're doing and um that could also be in a situation where you're like uh you know, my whole, my, my big thing is outreach to younger children because I feel that, you know, I, I look at some communities, it's like, like I didn't, I didn't know science, right, until, you know, I was at UCSD not that long ago. I went through a portion of my life, never had any experience with science, but the moment I saw it, I was like, that's what I want to do, right? And I can imagine just being around, like, you know, like I, I, I want to expose more and more people to science. And if they want to do that, they will know it, but you can't want to do something you know nothing about, right? So when you talk about science communication, that's what I think about, and that's one of the forms that it manifests in, right? And then there's the other form where, um, you know, there is people that resist, like so, like a situation like they're resisting the vaccine, 
to be able to convey why you should take the vaccine, even though they think it's quote unquote unnatural, whatever excuses they're using, it's just, I understand the biology of this and I could try to explain it to you. And if I can get you to understand, then maybe you'll come over and you'll say like, I'll get the vaccine, which we know is a positive thing, right? As scientists, we know that you should be, you know, if you get offered a vaccine, just take it because it's the only way we're going to get past the situation. The only way Joe's going to be able to come SF and, and really enjoy SF, you know, in its, in its, in its full openness, right? I, uh, I, I got my first shot on uh, Thursday this week. So my next one will be in about four weeks or something like that. But uh, Joe, good? I feel good. I feel good. I got the Pfizer vaccine. I uh, got my first shot on, uh, like I said, Thursday in the evening. Um, you know, I had a headache last night, but I always have headaches, so I don't know where it came from. And uh, yeah, yeah, I don't think there's so, any cor- correlation there. <laughs> no, I don't think so either. But uh, yeah, no, I feel good. Joe, a chance for a question. I know we've been going back and forth. Uh, yeah, just w- one follow-up question, and I, we've got to get to the album of the week. I know we got it. Really, yes, really great album. Really great yes, album. let's do that. Let's do that. Yeah. Um, but my question is, so for Francisco, you say that you do this research. On- stroke rehabilitation and you do it on a clinical or experimental level on mice does that mean that you somehow induce strokes into the mice's brain that you then attempt to correct yeah 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 how how do you induce the strokes into the mice's brain yeah this is getting into this touchy subject because people start thinking about like (laughs) animal rights and things like that and like you know it's like uh but for one i want you to know that these mice are treated better than i am like they are probably more important than i am to like you know science like they, they, you know, the thing, the hurdles we have to like, you know, you know, what we have to go through to even like run with the service is a lot, right? We pepper this crap out of these guys, right? Um, but yes, we induce a stroke, and the way we induce a stroke is it's called a prothrombic stroke, which you inject some sort of uh, um, some sort of chemical that when you induce some, when you introduce some sort of light, it just causes things to just rupture. Right? Just, the region just uh just goes crazy right and it's uh yeah it's it's yeah it's in general it's a photodromic uh stroke that we can induce very very controlled and targeted right? yeah 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 just targeted right like it, it's just like this i'm studying a very particular area of the brain right the like it's the m1 motor region right of the brain is like um i don't want to like inject something and it's like cause a stroke somewhere that i'm not interested in no no it's very controlled I can control the size of it to some extent, right? Because uh, if you know, start talking about size, you start talking about nanometers and things like that. I can control it to some extent, not you know to the full extent, but it's good yeah. enough to where it's like, yeah, it's, it's it's insane to just think about the fact that I can control it to the extent that I can, right? But uh, yeah. you can always do more, right? I can, I can yeah, it, like, right. You know, I always, I always thought that you would give the mouse a stroke by giving it a dead end job and a high mortgage and just slowly waiting for the stress to build up in the in the mice's oh, life. Yeah, yeah. It That's sounds like you guys are, are are much more humane than that, which I really appreciate. Um, Joe, let's let's go to the album of the week. This is a really good album uh, and uh, another great write up from our musical correspondent at the Roses Rendering Podcast. So, Joe, when you're ready, album of the week. The album of the week for this week is Thrill of the Arts, and the artist is Wolf Peck. So here's the review. The process of creation should be fun. No matter what you do, you if you do it with joy, people will be able to sense it. This week's album is brought to you by Wolf Peck, titled Thrill of the Arts. I don't know Wolf Peck's origin story, but I imagine they all met at a local YMCA after playing pickup basketball games. After the game, while chat while chatting and taking off their New Balance or Nike Air Monarchs, they soon realized their shared love of funk music and became friends. Their next logical step was to move to LA and form a band. Both Peck's debut album, Thrill of the Arts, is a tightly produced funk album which hits the soul and pop music. The overall sound of Thrill of the Arts is seriously groovy and infectiously fun. Volpec's music somehow conveys the comfortable absurdity found within great French works. The production of Thrill of the Arts captures that joy as they were simply jamming in the studio. The lyrical tracks Back Pocket, Funky Duck, Game Winner, 
and Christmas in LA are all witty and amusing. The album ends with the track Guided Smile Meditation, which is the most elaborate farm joke you have ever heard. And as one comedian put it, you don't have to be smart to laugh at a fart, but you'd be stupid not to. I would recommend listening to Thrill the Arts when you just need to smile. Art is at its best when it allows the observer to just walk around in their own mind, and we all deserve to walk around in the sun from time to time. Another great write-up, and I listened to that album during the week, and I really enjoyed it. A short album, I think, around a half an hour long, so, you know, if you're in the car or commuting or whatever, uh, put it on. I really enjoyed it. I thought it was really a, a great album and uh we're going to put as always links in the in the uh below the video in our tweets everything else you guys will be able to find it check it out it's on youtube i think a lot of the uh, wolfpack stuff is on youtube check them out of course you know buy it if if you can uh but really a, a lot of fun a lot of great music and uh i another great write-up it was a very fun album and very funky and uh, just a, a real joy for people who know um uh, Frank Zappa that had kind of a, of, of a little bit of a, of a Frank Zappa feel for some reason uh, to me a little bit. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a big Frank Zappa fan, of course, and, uh, but just a lot of fun. Just a, a really great album. Joe, I was, I was going to, you know, I, you guys are in, in the big city and I wanted to make sure we give you guys, you know, enough time to have fun. So I, we're going to probably wrap up soon. I wanted to give you a chance. Any other questions? Uh, and then we'll give it up to Francisco for any closing remarks he has before I uh, tie out the show. Uh, yeah, my only question is, uh, Francisco, where can our listeners find you? Nowhere. Where work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, uh, yeah, you know, for one, I just, I was thinking about this. This is actually being recorded. It's going to be posted somewhere, right? I just agreed to do it. Just, 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 you know, I just brought it up. I'll make sure why not. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I, I like to be low, low key and just like not, I don't like putting myself out there, right? It's just like, so it's, I guess, you know, I have a Twitter that I never use, and it was just because, like, hey, you're in science. There's a whole science Twitter community. You can be part of it, and I was like, sure. And um, I don't know. I, I'm still, I'm very one of those people that's like, I'm not a slow adapter of like, you know, social media. That I'm an active rejector, right? I just, I just feel people lose. So I don't know if you've got any sense, but just like, you know, and, and I appreciated that review because it's just like, you know. What are you feeling? What is enjoyable to you? And 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 that's what it's about for me, right? It's, it's about like, uh, you know, just just have a good time, uh, be yourself, right? And I feel like with, like, like do with things that make you happy, right? And I feel like with social media, it just completely like uh, overrides all that, right? There's there's this, all these experiences that are coming out and it's like the impact, the emotional impact that, that, that social media has on people, right? So, yeah. It's not natural. Yeah, I, I don't I don't stay away from it because of that. I just stay away from it because it's just the idea of it has never been appealing to me. So unfortunately, you might not be able to find me. You might uh, be able to like, uh, you know, read some articles and, and hear about me. But like, uh, I don't know. Unfortunately, sorry. Maybe one day I'll be comfortable and I'll come back on this podcast. It's like, hey, you know, here's my Twitter handle. That's what it's called, right? Twitter yeah, handle. Yeah, yeah. Or like Instagram or whatever. And uh, But for now, I'm sorry. If you want to hear more, maybe reach out to one of my buddies here and, and uh, you can get a hold of me. But like, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not in, in, a, in a place where you, you're going to find me. Well, what a great note to end on, everybody. Uh, and uh, <laughs> no, I'm giving you a hard time. Francisco, of course, we will respect your privacy. And uh, we do enjoy you being on the show today. A ton of great topics. I I have always felt, and I feel even more after talking to Francisco here, that uh, neuroscience is such a good application of two key themes on this show. One is complexity and the importance of complexity. I really think that the next frontiers in science will be much more about understanding complex interactions rather than trying to dig ever deeper and deeper into you know, the nature of the cosmos. Um, so to hear you guys working on the, on the neuroscience research is absolutely in that direction. And I think uh, there's a ton of fruit to be held. The other, of course, is the value of secrets. We talk about that all the time on the show, zero to one, Peter Thiel. Um, complexity yields itself to secrets because the more complex a system is, the harder it is to understand. So I think you are, you are definitely heading in the right direction in, in, in terms of very fruitful research career. I think you have a ton of great things ahead of you. 
Uh, the project that you're working on sounds incredibly important, incredibly interesting uh, to me. Um, like I said, I just want to clarify, I, like I said, I, I did get my, my first Pfizer shot during the week. As I said, I, I did get a headache, but I more attribute that to the fact that on that day, I, I got less caffeine than I normally do. But, uh, and my arm is a little sore, but nothing more than normal, really. So nothing bad to report there. Um, and I got, I got, uh, you know, I've been fully vaccinated for like two months now, and I'm still alive. I just want to say that. <laughs> Perfect. In case you didn't realize that I was alive. Still I'm kicking. Still, yeah, yeah. I'm still doing this. Francisco, life. alive, alive, kicking, doing well, doing important research. Um, as far as we can find us, you can find us on Twitter at roses underscore rhetoric, at our website, www.rosesandrhetoric.com, our Instagram, also roses underscore rhetoric, and of course, follow our charming co host, Joseph Stanford, at, at Jose four underscore Esquervo uh, on Instagram and on Twitter. Uh, but until next time, that will do it, folks. I'm going to sign off. I'm Jimmy Hackett, signing off for Justice Stanford and for Francisco, saying ciao.